Welcome to the world of the Ozark Hellbender. Crawl on in there, big guy. We'll hold that. I will flag the rock. This number will be 17. These salamanders have been part of our rivers for 160 million years. Missouri hellbender populations have declined by 80% over the past four decades. Biologists are trying to determine what factors are contributing to this decline by conducting population monitoring and health assessments. Hellbenders are our largest aquatic salamander in North America. And there's actually two different types or two subspecies, the Ozark hellbender and the Eastern hellbender. And M Missouri's the only state that has both subspecies. And the Ozark hellbender is only found in the Ozark mountain regions of Arkansas and Missouri. And there is a different status between these two animals. The Eastern hellbender is state endangered in Missouri and the Ozark hellbender is also state endangered, but it's also a federal endangered species. And in both cases, hellbenders in Missouri have been declining. We have a lot of data since the late 60s, early 70s, and we've noted anywhere from about a 70 to 80% decline of hellbenders throughout the state of Missouri. And uh, so the Department of Conservation, St. Louis Zoo, Fish and Wildlife Service, and many other agencies have been really working hard to save this animal from going extinct in the, in the wild. More than a decade ago, the St. Louis Zoo began working with state and federal agencies to save the hellbender. In 2004, the zoo created its 12-center wild care institute. The institute's Ron Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation was named for the zoo's late director of animal collections, who was a great believer in saving this salamander. St. Louis Zoo CEO Dr. Jeffrey Bonner explains why. Hellbenders are a great example of what I would call the canary in the coal mine. Uh, and since they're amphibians, they're highly sensitive to what's in the water. They breathe it, they drink it. And something's causing their demise. And, and we're drinking that same water, and we're swimming in it, and we're boating on it. And So what does that really mean for us? I mean, what's affecting them, and, and what does it mean for human populations? So they're, they're a great example of, of, of really utilizing the zoo's resources to make a difference for people, potentially a huge difference. Like all amphibians, hellbenders are able to breathe through their skin. As a result, toxins in the water can be absorbed as well. While the exact cause is not known, Ozark hellbenders have been turning up with deformities. In one Missouri River, researchers found that 67% of the hellbenders were deformed. The problems with our rivers affects us all. Here's a hellbender. This animal's probably somewhere 20, 25 years of age and somehow it's surviving with no toes. I mean, it should have four toes on each front, five toes on each back, and it's nothing but stubs. When Wild Care Institute was started in 2004, um, Ron selected the Hellbender as the one that he wanted to concentrate on here uh, as one of the Wild Care Centers. And so for you know, the last 10 plus years, we've been you know, working towards captive reproducing Hellbenders in Missouri. First thing we'll do is we'll take some swabs for disease. It's most prevalent on the feet, but we'll do swabs in different locations. What's really unique is this animal is very adapted to the river. It likes cold water habitats, which Missouri's blessed with all these large springs to put in cold water. But the animal itself, when you look at them, they're totally adapted to that river environment. They have this flat head that allows them to get underneath the rock. And then they have these folds of skin down the side of their bodies. They just ripple these little wrinkles of skin along the side of their body and they can absorb all their oxygen out of the water. I was told early on that it'd be very hard to make this species a charismatic species and that people wouldn't get attached to it and things like that because they're, some people think they're not attractive, uh, that they, they're, never, they're hardly ever seen, but it's the exact opposite. Charismatic as these animals may be, they join amphibians around the world in facing the threat of a type of fungus called amphibian chytrid fungus. Amphibian chytrid fungus was first identified in 1999. We're doing blood samples to look for you know, heavy metals. And a lot of that's going to be long term, but as they age and that starts to change, and you're under all these other environmental assaults, you know, you have 
alterations to your habitat, you've got a lot of sedimentation going on, you've got chemical contaminants now. Then you're really trying to fight and to bring that population back up to a level where it's sustainable. And that's really what we're hoping to do through our captive propagation efforts is to be able to you know, produce enough offspring, raise them up to six to eight years of age, put them back out into the areas where the eggs were collected. Water depth, 73. Biologists began collecting and hatching eggs from the wild in 2002. After hatching, the larvae were brought to the zoo, where they were raised in a controlled environment. 12 rocks within a meter square. So that's why we've got three populations of zoo. We have a population from the current river, one from the 11 point, and one from the north fork. So we're not just going to be breeding hellbenders willy-nilly and sticking them back into rivers where they occur. They're going to be very specific to where the parent stock originated from. In 2012, the center released 50 head-started hellbenders into the wild. Yay, first one out. <laughs> Yahoo! With its partners, the zoo built one indoor stream and two large outdoor streams. The zoo's streams have been set up to mimic wild conditions, including the availability of rocks for hiding and seasonal changes in light cycle and water temperature. With all of this, you might think hellbenders would be easy to breed. However, it took many years. The key to success appears to be a combination of various elements, along with the manipulation of water quality and the addition of artificial nest boxes. We were told initially that we would probably never be able to get animals to cycle indoors. Um, since 2007, we've had eggs laid every year by our females indoors. Um, and it coincides exactly with the same time that their wild counterparts in southern Missouri are laying. A couple years ago, I really started looking at hellbenders, um, more of like breeding fish instead of breeding salamanders, because they're very different than a lot of other salamanders. And I think that that was a key turning point. Ron Gellner and I met, I'll never forget, back in about 2002. And at that time, very little was going on. Hellbenders, the zoo had a couple, and we wrote a proposal and uh, started removing animals back in around 2004 and, and had added them into an indoor raceway. We've all tried so hard to get these animals to breed in captivity. And uh, every year we get closer and closer and we think this is gonna be the year and this is gonna be the year. And last year, which was 2011, uh, was our year. We were so excited because this is, it's not like this happened overnight. It's been many years in the making. There's been success all along the way to learn to get to that point. But I'll have to say in my career, last year was probably may be the biggest milestone in my life in the St. Louis Zoo and, and what was achieved at the zoo. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget that day seeing those eggs and just being there knowing we did it. <laughs> They're a truly unique animal. They've been around for a long, long time. And uh, just to think that a, a relic species like this is still surviving in our river systems and hopefully will survive from this point on with our help, I think is enough to kind of solidify it for me. Um, we need to, you know, continue to breed hellbenders year after year to know that we've figured out the key to success, but I think we're definitely on the right track. The stuff we've learned and how all these pieces of this puzzle come together and knowing that we're all contributing into this bigger picture of, of saving this animal. And just knowing that drives all of us and our passion for this animal. And I hope 30 years from now I can come back here and there's hundreds of hellbenders here and although I would love to study this animal the rest of my life I'm hoping one day we don't have to because they're doing well and we're studying something else that we need to save. I refuse at least while I'm still on this planet to watch things just disappear you know I mean I grew up with I grew up with lots of people in what I call the concrete jungle that have never been camping, they've never done anything. And they're the ones that question me all the time. Why should I worry about a hellbender going extinct? Doesn't it impact my day-to-day -day life? And I'm like, how can you say that? You really don't even know the role that they play in the bigger picture. It may very well impact your survival. It's important to save all species. It's it's sort of like the first rule of intelligent tinkering is, is not to throw away any of the pieces. You want to learn everything you can about what is affecting them because it's certainly affecting us.